Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 133. The artist sees what others only catch a glimpse of. Leonardo da Vinci. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to a special Sundance edition of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Distriber. If you guys are trying to get your movies or feature films or even shorts onto Netflix, Hulu, Google Play, iTunes, Fandango, or any of the major streaming services, Distriber finally lets you in without having to go through a traditional distributor. And you keep 100% of all the revenues and your rights. So if you want more information, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. The show is also sponsored by Hollywood Camera Work. If you guys are interested in learning how to direct actors and become a actor's director, Hollywood Camera Work has developed an amazing master course called Directing Actors. And it is almost 30 hours. And I've taken this course. And it is by far the most comprehensive directing actors course I have ever seen. So if you want to get access to this course, head over to hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 30% off. That's hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE. So in my journeys at Sundance, I ran into a ton of different filmmakers who have been working with Netflix. Now, I know a lot of you in the news have heard that Netflix is is pretty much taking over the industry. But uh, not just that, but they're giving filmmakers basically blank checks and make and letting them make the movies that they want to make. And I found it extremely hard to believe because I've been in the business for so long. It didn't sound like it was a realistic thing, but I actually had the pleasure of bringing on a filmmaker who's just finished a, a movie for Netflix. And she told me her entire story of uh, how they worked with each other, uh, what kind of freedom she had, how hands on or half off, hands off Netflix was. And I do think that this could be the future for a lot of independent filmmakers to be able to strike deals with a Netflix, an Amazon, a Hulu, or an Apple uh, as it's coming up in the future to be able to create original content and give the voice to the artist, to the filmmaker. Uh, it's very, very exciting. So I happen to uh, have a chance to talk to an extremely impressive young lady. Her name is Sydney Friedland. Uh, her first film, Drunk Town's Finest, uh, premiered at Sundance. A few years ago, and she worked with the Sundance Labs, and and she told us all about her experiences uh, working with the Sundance Labs, getting that first phone call to get into Sundance, and then after that, she was approached by Netflix to do a film called Deidre and Lainey Rob a Train. I'm going to put the the trailer in the show notes, guys. It looks hilarious. What a, <laughs> two young ladies decide to actually rob a train and start a business robbing trains. Uh, and to help her, their sick mother. And it's pretty, pretty funny. The trailer looks incredible. But I really wanted to get into the into the weeds with her and talk about what how much freedom she actually had as a filmmaker and what it was like working with Netflix. So I think this is a very eye-opening interview for everybody involved. And like I said before, she is extremely impressive. Her accomplishments are remarkable, really. I felt so under-accomplished when I talked to her. So this episode is co-hosted by my good friend Sebastian Tordas as well. So please enjoy our conversation with Sydney Friedland. Hi, I'm Alex Ferrari. And I'm Sebastian Tordas, and thanks for watching our show. We are here with Sydney Freeland, who's a filmmaker with your second film at Sundance. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> very, very cool. I saw the trailer. It looks hilarious. Can you tell us a little about the, the movie? Uh, yeah, so DJ and Laney, Rob a Train, is, it's a dark comedy uh, about a single mom has an apparent mo- emotional breakdown outside of an electronics store and uh, gets thrown in jail. And so her two teenage daughters decide to take up train robbing to bail, to get money to, to, to bail her out. I love it. Yeah. I do. I love it's a great, it's a great, great Yeah, t- teenage, teenage train robbers. Yes, in today's world. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and Netflix picked it up. Correct. Yeah, I uh, know. Uh, Netflix financed the film uh, up front. Oh, okay, so it's a Netflix all the way. So. Yeah, it's a Netflix original. Oh, nice. So how 
So in, how did it feel like when you got the first phone call for your first movie to be in Sundance? And, and what was your first movie then? Yeah. What was it like? Oh, man. That was <laughs> cool. Uh, so my first film was played in 2014. It was called Drunk Town's Finest. Uh-huh. Um, you know, much different, much different scenario than this this mm-hmm. film. And what was it like getting the call? Because um, it's a dream. It's like you won, you won the lottery. It's like the filmmaking lottery is basically getting yeah, Sundance call. Yeah. Did you have? Did you do the labs or anything like that, or did you just submit it and, and yeah? So I just did, hope for the best. I did. Uh, I participated in the Native Lab, which is for Native American. So you and, did do the Native Lab, Indigenous first. filmmakers. Yeah, okay. and then. Um, 2009, 2010, I did the Screenwriters Lab and the Director's Lab. Oh, so you Sundance. did all the labs. Can you tell us about the labs? Because yeah, okay. a lot of people actually don't know that Sundance does all these labs. What are they? What was that experience like? And then, and then we'll, we'll go talk right about into, both, both yeah. films again, actually, yeah. because I, we want to dig down a little more on them. Yeah, so the labs are run by the Institute, and they are two separate labs. The Screenwriters Lab is this five-day intensive where um, the Institute will select 12 films, um, or 12 screenplays, 12 feature screenplays from approximately 1,200 submissions. And um, those 12 screenwriters are invited to the resort and you spend five days meeting with professional screenwriters and they essentially tear your film apart, you know, but it's all, it's, <laughs> it's all, yeah it's, yeah, it's constructive and it's designed to like really sort of break this thing down with the idea that you'll come out and make it better. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, but it is an intensive you know, and it's funny because they, they tell you um, when you get there, it's like, find a place for your cry. And I was like, I remember going the first time, I was like, I'm not going to cry. This is a screenplay. And then I cried twice. Did, you, so. Did other people cry? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? So that, well, it's like, it's like um, what's when, when you go, uh, scared straight. <laughs> Uh, it's like yeah, scary straight for, for, for development. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for development, actually, like scary straight. Say, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> Are they like yelling at you? Oh, God, it's a structure. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say yeah. That would be an awesome movie, by the way. Yeah. We actually made that. The Sundance Labs by uh, MSNBC. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Dateline. Yeah, it's Sundance. It's locked up. <laughs> locked, locked, locked up at Sundance. Exactly. So, um, they, but they really go like they, I'm assuming they just completely tear it apart, break it down to its core, and then they build it. It's like a military exercise. They break you down. And then they build you back up, in a uh, sense. Yeah, yeah, in, the story. In, in an artistic sense. Yes, uh, yes. Actually, I think that's a great way to put it. It's like artistic boot camp. Okay, you know, yeah, great. Um, but but the idea, uh, but the, I think the core idea behind it is that they, they break you down, but then it's and they try to provide you with the tools so that you can tell your own story. You know, it's not telling you how to. They don't try to tell you how to tell your story. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like trying to help you find your own. And story. And you did more than one lab. How many labs did you do? Over I, uh, several years. Yeah, Native Lab, right. Screeners Lab, Directors Lab, and um, and then I also did uh, the Women's Fellowship in 2015. So you basically grew up at Sundance. Uh, yeah, I, I I consider Sundance to be my film school. Yeah, that's not a or, film school to be. Or I would I would the way I sort of put it is like uh, my film school taught me the alphabet. Sundance teaches you how to form a sentence. It's a great. Love it. That's awesome. That's really really. So, good. but your first film was a document. So. W- your first one was a documentary. I, I kind of want to get the timeline on sure. this, like when 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 you first got here, and then when you when the documentary came about, and then when you got to Deidre. Oh, for the first feature? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, that was it was a narrative. Well, the first one was. A, oh, why didn't yeah. I think it was a? Oh my, oh, it, drunk. It was a late. It was a late night. It yeah. was as well. <laughs> we, we've had some of those already. We've had a, it was okay. a late night. Oh, okay. So wait. So what was it about? Because I did not see it. So obviously. the first feature was uh, Drunk Town's Finest, yeah. uh, a contemporary ensemble uh, piece about Native Americans. Okay. Um, or uh, I, the short pitch is uh, it's Crash with Indians. <laughs> so a, a big budget, okay. very mass appeal movie. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a four quadrant uh, film. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and how did that do? Uh, how, like, what was the life cycle of that film? Yeah. So it actually um, so it premiered here. Uh, so I had a had a Good festival run, played in about seventy five festivals. Wow! Um, wow. And uh, you know, we sold international. We have domestic distribution. Um, it's currently on iTunes, Amazon, you know, all those portals. And um, but I think most importantly for this film is that I came out of the festival and was able to sign with a management company and get a manager. Mm-hmm. And my manager is the person who got me this current script, Deidre and Laney. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then that, and that, and you, and that was a Netflix original, so it went right to yeah. Netflix right after that. Yeah. How is it working with Netflix? Uh, Netflix has been great. They, really? Yeah, I think people say, like, they were like, oh, they're very hands-off, and I didn't really know what that meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it literally means hands-off. And, and they just get, here's a check, 
Oh, we need a movie in so many. Movies. Yeah, so so we we went in, we pitched the film. You know, yeah. we pitched the film, and um... we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, <clears throat> did a couple of revisions to the script, and they, uh, you know, essentially financed the film up front. Mm-hmm. Said, "Here's the funding. Uh, please deliver us a film," and gave us a, a lot of creative freedom. You know. And they did give notes. They did give. They did give feedback, and but the notes and feedback were were extremely constructive and helpful. Really cool. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a really great experience. No, I wanted to go back to that one question I asked you. What was it like getting that first phone call? Oh right. I don't know that she had that first phone call because you. I mean, you, you grew up, that process. I did. Yeah. You go, well, you, what was? Oh, and then what was the like getting the first phone call that you got into the first lab? Because that's still kind that's, of like that's kind of like a lottery ticket. So own, right? yeah. So the native lab was. Um, so the Native Lab, it's more of a feeder program. Mm-hmm. You know, it's they're they're kind of like feeder programs into the larger labs. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I remember getting the call for the Screenwriters Lab, and I was um, I was in my my home, or I was in my dad's home in New Mexico, and I got the call, and then I went out into the living room, and I I just I literally broke down crying and fell on the floor. You know, because wow. it was like you know, because you sort of like as a filmmaker, you try. It's very hard. You know, and you you have you know it's very hard to get a film made, <laughs> and it's yes. it's even harder to get support for like even like a screenplay. Mm-hmm. You know, and so for myself, um, you know, I'm coming I'm coming from a background where I grew up on a I grew up on the Navajo reservation in New Mexico. Uh, film the film industry is is Min- a lot. minimal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Minimal is 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 a, is a very optimistic term, um, non-existent. Right. You know, the film industry in in back home is non-existent. Like all this is, you know, doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, the concept, I, I remember for me grasping the concept of like filmmaking was this like radical thing for me. Like wait, people can make movies. And then beyond that, it was like, wait, people get paid to work on movies. I know. I, I had the same feeling like, what? Like, yeah. People like, what? Yeah. And so that, that was a completely foreign concept to me. And Well, but, what I find fascinating too is um, there's a lot of people listening and watching who are in the same position you are, like in a filmmaking vacuum. Basically, that there's no support. There's no infrastructure. For, and like, if you're in LA, obviously, it's super easy to become a filmmaker. And not to be a successful filmmaker, but to learn and to, and to work and stuff like that. Yeah. All the tools are there. But it's so much more impressive, I think, coming from your background, to be like, you've got to do everything yourself. You have to go out and search that information. You've got to rally people to, like, do you want to be in a movie? What's, what do you mean? What, like, that's so much more difficult. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how did you get your first like, short done? I'm trying to even think what my first short was. Um, it, it was a while ago, but I, I think... Basically, what my sort of my sort of timeline was: I went to film school. I graduated okay. uh, the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Oh, that's a good. That's a good school. So, yeah, and, and it you know. Well, well, I, well, I actually want to go back a little further because yeah. you grew up in the Navajo Reservation. When did you know you wanted to make movies? How did you get out? I mean, how did how did that happen? I mean, it is a different world. Sure, sure. So, growing up, you know, like uh, I was there's there's a huge there's a lot of arts in in yes. on the reservation, Sa- but it's, it's more especially. kind of like yeah, it's more sort of like I say like traditional mediums, you know, painting, weaving, pottery, uh, silversmithing, uh, things like that. Sure. So that's what I was that's what I was exposed to growing up, and so I went to um, undergraduate school to study painting and drawing. Because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Where did you go? Uh, Arizona State. Okay. Uh, go, go Devils. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> he's from Arizona. He's from Arizona. Yes, yes, yes. Austin. Austin, 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 our camera guy, is from Arizona. Wildcat shooting. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, uh, so, in, you know, while I was in school, I was exposed to you know a number of things: computer art, computer animation, photography, uh, creative writing. You know, even creative writing was like this like new thing. It was like, wait, like you can just write and tell a story. And, you know, and someone might paint. Well, no, not even paint, but like you can write for fun, you know. Right. And um, and so and then my final semester, I took this class. It was called like it was something generic, it was like movies or video or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, it was basically cinema one hundred and one. And we made these little short films in there. And I, you know, not to sound cliche, but it was sort of like, oh, this is what I want to do, mm-hmm. you know. And um, what I liked about it is that like all those things I just mentioned, it combined into one. You know, and it was, but it was still telling a story. And uh, so from there, I applied to film school. Again, knew nothing about film school. And so how I got to the, 
to the Academy of Art was I did a Google search for graduate film programs, mm-hmm. and I got an alphabetical list. And the first hit was Academy of Art, uh-huh. AAU. And so it was in San Francisco. And it was like, to have that. Yeah. And it was like, I That's love San Francisco. That's how Netflix or some of the things work too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love San Francisco. Yeah. I'll go there. And that's how I got to film school. That's awesome. That's very, very Okay, cool. but there's, there's more. Were you a Fulbright scholar? Uh, yeah, that was uh, 2004. I mean, this is, this is, you've got some amazing <laughs> you're things. F- you're fairly impressive, I have to say. <laughs> was there computer animation somewhere in here? Yeah, that was, so that was... I mean, why do you miss all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, 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 so technically the, um, yeah, I, my, my BFA degree is technically in computer animation. Okay, although cool. I realized very quickly that was not, I don't, I don't have the, um, um, uh, you have to be extremely patient to be an animator, yes, yeah, and it's it's a very. I I love the result, but I think the process is very intensive, yeah. um, and um, uh, yeah, and, and so that's that that's why. Okay, I that's that part. Yeah. And well, where did Fulbright come in? Oh, that's pretty impressive too. So this Fulbright was for a. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm probably. I might butcher this, but it's for a field study of indigenous peoples of the Ecuadorian Andes and Amazon. Wow. Wow. Uh, long, uh, short way of saying, you know, spending uh, uh, 10 weeks in uh, Ecuador. That, I think, you know, that's, by the way, where I got the documentary thing in my head. Because oh, okay. I read about yeah, the Fulbright. Yeah, I was like, oh, I, th- I thought that was the way in at yeah, some point. Yeah, yeah. So, and it, so you sound very lazy, and you don't seem like you like to work a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting, it's a really interesting journey. Uh, and then, and then you, you did do shorts, but... One of the standout ones was hoverboard. Yeah, hoverboard. So what is it? So okay, so that's so that I think this is a, I think this is a perfect example for like people who are maybe like trying to get into the industry. So 2007, I graduated from film school, moved to Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, and um, <laughs> should I tell should I tell the story? My first. All right. Let's hear it, please. Okay, so this is how I got my first job <laughs> in Los Angeles. Right. Yes. Um, I finished film school. I go back to the reservation. Mm. Um, I did a I did a summer program in Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm-hmm. and I met a person there who was like working with a producer. He says, "Hey, I live in Los Angeles. Um, uh, if you have a resume, we may have something that we're working on later on. I can pass it along if you want." Blah blah blah. Okay, fine, whatever. I gave him my resume. Didn't think twice about it. Fast forward a couple of weeks. Um, I'm now back home on the reservation, mm. um, trying to think like, what do I do now? Uh, I just I'm student. I <laughs> I've got mountain of uh, student loans I need to repay. Yes. Um, and uh, I remember I was in the parking lot of a Walmart. And so it was a Friday. Um, so it's Friday evening in the parking lot of a Walmart in Gallup, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking like, what the hell am I going to do? And I get a phone call um, from like, you know, this 310 area code. I don't know, 310 area code, you know. <laughs> it's, it's LA. It's LA, yeah. It's LA, and and it's so LA. It's, it's this person on the phone is like, hey, Sydney, I'm a producer. Um, I have your resume. Um, uh, can you come in? Can you come in for an interview Sunday at midnight? And what day was it? You? It's Friday. Yeah. So he says, "Can you come in Sunday at midnight? At midnight at a Starbucks in Westwood." What? And I was sitting in the parking. That's, that's very LA, though. That is kind of LA. And, and so, I wouldn't do that. And I was yeah. standing. I know, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was standing in the parking lot, and I was thinking, and this, you know, the prison didn't know I was in New Mexico. So sure, I, was, sure. I was standing in the parking lot. And I was like, <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> and, and then you robbed the train. That's the right answer, by the yeah. way. <laughs> then you robbed the train, hopped yeah. on it. Then, yes. No, so then I, I threw all my shit in my car. I drove to L.A., never been there before, pulled in about 10 p.m. on a Sunday night. <laughs> to the Starbucks. Yeah, and this is, you know, I had the map questing because I didn't have GPS at the time. Sure, sure. Um, the map quest printout on the paper. Oh, yeah. Showed yeah. up at a... Showed up at Starbucks at Westwood at midnight, and there's this, you know, old ex hippie guy in the back room or in the back, you know, waved me over. I came over, we talked for five minutes, and he said, "Huh, you seem okay. Uh, show up at this address tomorrow, eight a.m." And um, and it was wow. it was for a um, it was the first episode of a twenty six um, episode run of an Asian cooking show, and I was a PA on that. Really? And so yeah, so that sort of got that got me my first job, and um, and then so and then. From there, um, I primarily worked in camera and editing departments, would mm-hmm. go back and forth. And then, um, so that's sort of what my production background is. And then, um, you know, sort of going back and forth, uh, some, you know, second AC, a little bit of first, uh, media manager, DIT, assistant uh, editor, um, some post production supervising, and sort of swinging back and forth between those two departments. And in between gigs, I would just direct short films. 
or I shoot short films. And um, um, at and there was you know at one point it was like you know I just I just want to shoot something. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I had Drunk Town just find us in development and it was taking, you know, it was like in its like sixth year of just like rewriting. And I said, I just want to shoot something. I don't care. Um, I'm trying to get this film made and it's not getting made. And I just want to shoot something. And so I was talking with a friend of mine. She said, well, stop complaining. Go just something. go shoot something. And so we talked for a little bit and we started talking about, our, you know, our, our childhoods. And um, I had this sort of affinity for Back to the Future 2. Well, well, of course. And, and we were talking about this idea and this idea for the short film Hoverboard um, came out and essentially just got some friends together on a weekend. We shot it for two days and it was just purely because like I just wanted to make something. Yeah. And, um, and that, that uh, short actually became a calling card that um, for Deidre and Lane Robert Train. So I shot that in like 2011, mm-hmm. and we didn't shoot Deidre and Lane until 2016. How do you find that short? Uh, so yeah, if you if you go on, it's on YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you do a YouTube search for Hoverboard PBS, mm-hmm. um, it'll pop up. I mean, if you just do Hoverboard, it'll probably show up too. So can you talk a little bit, because you're talking about being a PA, and I know a lot of people listening are like trying to break into the business, and, and they get into the PA aspect of things, but you got into camera and post. Mm-hmm. Explain how important that is being an independent filmmaker because I'm I've been in post for twenty odd years yeah. and I couldn't do what I do without that knowledge uh, without that experience same thing with my camera experience so can you explain how that impacted your yeah. filmmaking Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, having having a production background has been like, I mean, it was so crucial for me to be able to direct my first feature. Right. So, um, I think being being a PA was. It, it was valuable because even though you may be on, a little bit on the periphery of a film set, mm-hmm. you're still learning something. You're in the right? orbit. Yeah. And so like I'm doing like Firewatch next to a generator for 12 hours and I'm thinking like, what the, what the hell am so, I So doing? explain to people what Firewatch so is. Fire, Firewatch is basically you're just standing guard. You know? so, so, the, so the generator, if it blows up, you'll get hit first and then everybody can turn it up. Yeah, it out, yeah, basically. Yeah. So it was like, I think, I think this, this particular instance, it was like shooting, uh, I think it was a PA on a short film in New York and uh-huh. it was a neighborhood that, that they didn't want anyone stealing the generator. Sure, that's it. So I had to sit there, stand guard next to the generator for 12 hours while it's like, you know, like anyone who knows the Jennies on set, they're, they're not the quietest uh, oh my machines. God, yeah. And they um, smell wonderful. They do. They, they do, smell yes. wonderful. Yeah, lovely yes. smell. <laughs> lovely uh, smell. <laughs> gasoline or diesel or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so I think well, I didn't realize at the time, but I was learning something, right. you know? And so each sort of aspect that you work on, you're learning a little bit about the process. So when it came time, when I had the opportunity to direct my first feature, um, we didn't have a lot of money and we had a very extremely short shoot, shoot schedule. It was a, a 15 day shoot, um, for, for this, uh, for this feature that I had written. And what I found out during that process was, um, you know, everything moved so quickly but I, I had a working knowledge of what I could or could not ask for, you know? So like, like for example, they, you know, they would be like, okay, so we're going to, we're going to shoot this scene out and then we're going to, um, this next one we have to be at in 45 minutes. And so like, I kind of doing like internal calculations. Okay. This, how long does it take to break down the camera, get in the car, get it to the next place. Um, and so I could, you know, sort of like give my like production design. Okay. So I need you guys to have this set up by, you know, in approximately this time because we're going to come in and we're going to have to shoot, you know? And, um, and also, you know, in terms of editing as well, too, just knowing um, sort of like what... What you need. Yeah, what, what you need, what you don't need. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that being said, I still learned a hell of a lot. Of course. You know? yeah. and, but, and that was Drunk Town, right? That was Drunk Town, yes. When did Sundance come into the equation? So Sundance was uh, 2009. That was the Native Lab. Mm-hmm. And then 2010 was the script of Drunk Town. Got it. And, um, and so that's when we did... 2010 did the Screeners Lab and Directors Lab with Drunk Town's Finest. Got it. And then 2013 is when we got the financing and shot the film, and then it premiered in got it. 2014. And during, and during all this time, what are you doing to like survive? <laughs> uh, yeah, just work, again working production. You yeah, know, working production jobs. Yeah. What about Disney? Isn't were you Disney Fellowship or Disney Scholarship? What was yeah, that? Yeah, so that that was the internship uh, that I, I mentioned in Santa Fe. Mm-hmm. So it was a uh, ABC Disney did a summer summer program. Uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, huh. and um, and that's where I met the person. It was uh, I mean, it was a great program. Actually, I still keep in touch with probably like 
there's probably like a group of 10 or 15 of us. That still I mean, you couldn't have mapped this out if you I tried, mean, seriously, right? I mean, enough. you kind of just figured it out as you went along. Yeah, like. yeah. I very much made it up as I went along. And I think, I think one thing that I've, I, I've sort of, I had this sort of like really sort of interesting moment where, so 2015, I, I participated in a program called the Fox uh, Global Directors Initiative. Yeah. 20 women, women filmmakers. Um, and during that point, we, everyone went around the table and they had to tell how they got to be in that room. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think I've always sort of felt like an outsider to the film industry um, in terms of like, you know, okay, there is a path and people take that path. And um, I'm not taking that path, but I'm like in the woods trudging, trudging along trying to find my way, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I think what I found out in this, so this is now 2015, and hearing all these women go around the table and tell their stories of how they got to be there, there's no one way. <laughs> you know, everyone had like such different stories. Like people come from like a dancing background, people mm -hmm. come from like a writing background, people mm -hmm. come from, you know, some people come from families of filmmakers, some people come from like uh, countries where there is no, you know, like countries where there's no film industry. And so I think that was a very valuable thing for me, you know, was realizing that there is no one way to become a filmmaker. And when I think it's, it's, I think a lot of, as far as filmmakers are concerned, a lot of people think that that path that has been marketed so well, like you go to film school, you do this, you do that. Um, you learn a lot more going in the woods, uh, in, uh, on the side tracks. You'll survive out there much more than the guy who takes the pre, the, the guy or the girl that takes that pre built path. And I think that's well, isn't it, isn't well, yes and no, but she sort of did. I mean, she did do film school, but the, 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 no, no, the, no, the no, thing so. about it is that that's not enough. Like people no, go school. to film school and yeah, they right. think it's made, no, but it's not. In 1972, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, you yeah, just the, went to film the, school. The, then, yeah. yeah, there's a huge, huge gap between film school and working in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now, now we're making a living. <laughs> there's yes, work because exactly, like you can work, exactly. but then make a living actually is yeah, is a whole. Exactly. Is a whole other story, <laughs> without question. Cool. You have any questions? No, I mean, I'm I'm sort of just just hearing the story. I mean, it's very inspiring. It's also sort of like wow. No, it's it's honestly the the story is, is so inspiring because the one thing I want, did want to say is that, and it's hopefully it's an inspiration to anyone listening is that you come from a, a place that you had no support as far as industry is concerned, no information, no knowledge, no anything. But you decided to start doing something. You started to go on that path. And it seems like the universe has helped you along the way because you just started that energy. You didn't well, wait well, for yes. someone to knock on the door for you. But I'm also wondering, I mean, I, the one, I do have the one question. I mean, this is the kind of story when I hear this one, I'm just like, what keeps you, like what, what drives you? I mean, what makes you do it? Because it, wasn't, it doesn't sound like it was very easy either. Uh, no, no. You have a drive. There's no, there's no question <laughs> about that. There's a drive there. I don't know. There's definitely a drive there. Um, I, I mean, again, like I think, well, I, I just have two parts to that. I think one is that on really basic levels, like I, I love making film, right? Um, and on a really basic level, it's like I just, I, I had a story, I wanted to tell it. Mm -hmm. And the desire to tell that story outweighed the, um, you know, the rejections. You know, yeah, there's and, a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I think that's, that's one thing I had to learn was how to deal with rejection because you get rejected way more than you get accepted. Oh. <laughs> I, I think, I think when, I was, when I was doing actually doing production work and setting up my resume, mm -hmm. like I got to this point where I was like, man, if I could get one callback out of 20 resume sendouts, that was like, that's, that's I actually, was killing it. That, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, that's really good. If yeah, you got yeah. I was like, I'm killing it, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, you get those 19 other, you know, like, oh, unfortunately, you know, we're... Unfortunately, we can't take you right now yeah. because of that. So, but I will, I do want to sort of like single out you know, like the Sundance Labs, right? Because, and specifically the the Sundance Native Lab, because, so that was, I, I believe it was like 1985, and like that was founded by Robert Redford, you know, especially for fostering Native American and indigenous uh, filmmaking talent. And so I, you know, for me, I, I'm sort of coming at this, like I want something to say and I don't know how to say it. And this program existed um, and I, and I was fortunate enough to be selected for it and it gave me structure, you know, it gave me structure. It gave me a little bit of direction and a little bit of guidance where I was just sort of like, kind of like wandering through the woods and saying like, I just, I want to do something, but I don't know how to do it. You know? And so yeah, you are the embodiment of Sundance, but there is one thing that we almost forgot that this leads into yeah. standing rock. 
Yes, oh, yeah. Standing Rock. Yeah. Yes, you are yeah. Standing Rock. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, uh, this past December, I was, um, I had the opportunity to go up to uh, Standing Rock and shoot some footage for Vice. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, for their documentary Rise, which is actually showing here in uh, at the festival as well. Um, I think it's a fantastic. I, I shot I shot like this much footage for the thing, uh, so I had a chance to see it on Saturday night. I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. But you were there. Yes. So, what's your experience of Stan yeah. Rock? So I would say, you know, it's it's. I think what's come out of it that's been positive is that. Native Americans don't necessarily exist in popular culture or in, in mainstream American society. And what I, what I thought was so great about that was that Standing Rock and the protests, the No Dapple movement, um, elevated this issue and made it a, you know, part of the national sort of conversation. And it's very rare that happens for you know, the Native American community. Yeah. Um, They're international. A lot of interna- yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. I, I, internationally, yeah. it was it was an international. Event. Somehow, somehow, internationally, they embraced Native Americans more than yeah, Americans. Yeah, that, that, that is true. Which, yeah, that yes. is true. Yeah, I think with, with Drunk Town, it, it was interesting. Like, I found you know an audience, an audience, you know, specifically like in Europe, mm-hmm. very interested in that. But I guess to get back to Sandy Rock, it was. I, I think for me, it was it was hard to watch stuff, you know, from a distance and see like, you know explicit and blatant, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, an unnecessary use of force against unarmed and unarmed sort of population who were peacefully protesting. Um, and I think the, the day we actually got there was the day that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, denied and uh, it had an easement denial mm-hmm. for the, um, uh, for the um, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline to continue moving forward. And that was a, at the time it was, it felt like a victory you know, because it was like, wow, like, look at what this can, you know, this was a nonviolent, peaceful protest. And it, it on one side, it was nonviolent. <laughs> yes, 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 sorry. Yes, on, 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 um, on, the, on the native side. And it actually made a difference, you know? And I mean, for me, that was, that was amazing because usually natives get fucked, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, yeah. Native Americans get fucked. And in, oh, sorry, I don't know. It's, okay. it's fine. Okay. We, 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 we curse, okay. we curse yeah. all the fucking Although we it's haven't, okay. so, <laughs> yeah, so, 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 you know, we're making you look bad, but <laughs> yeah. no, no, it's no, hard no, to make no, you look no. bad, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're the riffraff, so thank you for coming down. Yeah. And, 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 so, and so I, you know, like I felt like I, I wanted to do something yeah. and um, I had this opportunity to go and shoot footage. At the time, I didn't know it was for Vice. I didn't know it was for Rise. Mm. Um, I just wanted to go out there and like try to do something. And you know, if I could see these people on this other side and look them face to face, you know, and then I wanted to be able to look these people in the eye and ask them like, "Why are you guys doing this?" Um, and uh, it, it was, I think, it was a really amazing experience for me because I got to see natives from. You know, Native American and Indigenous people from not only from the U.S. or Canada, but from all over the world, you know, coming together in this like huge um, Osheti Sakawin camp, mm-hmm. and uh, and everyone is there with one sole purpose, you know, save the water. And know? it was it was the first time that all the tribes got together, right? In in, in American history, right? If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I am not a historian, but it was I would say is one of the one of if not the largest sort of gathering of. Native the, Americans, yeah. At one time. Yeah. I can't even remember the last time there was a protest of that size, other than a few days ago. That, um, <laughs> the women's, other than the Women's March. Other than the Women's Which March. would have been better had it not right. been you know, yeah. so cold out in most yeah, of the Yeah, exactly. The, the country, but, no, but like something like, you know, like I remember Sel- obviously Martin Luther King and Selma and that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's like but, that. Yeah, but like a political, you know. It's ha- a full-on movement. It's a full-on movement. I hadn't seen anything like Although that Although what's interesting about it is we don't have one person yet that embodies it like like Martin Luther King. Not yet, yeah. There wasn't the person. Yeah, there was no one standout at Standing Rock. There was there? Was there a leader? There isn't yet. Yeah, there 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 are There's a handful. Yeah, there's a handful. There's a handful of people, but there wasn't like the Martha Luther King. But maybe that's a good thing too. I don't know. That's true, yeah. Because it's a movement as opposed to a person. I don't know. It's interesting. But that's very interesting. So let me ask you one last uh, question. What advice would you give a filmmaker just starting out? 
where you were in that parking lot <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all those years ago. I, I think I think that the most important lesson I've I've been able to take away is just learn learn to accept rejection okay. and learn. But not only that, learn to learn to see rejection as an opportunity to make your story better. You know, uh, if it gets rejected, um, maybe you know, to be a perfectly honest, maybe it wasn't good enough. You know, but take that and try to use that to say, what can I make? What can I do to make this project better? Or what can I do to make this story better? Um, I think that to me was one of the biggest learning experiences I had to go through because it's it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to get rejected. Oh God! <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a creative environment as well. I mean, it's tough to get rejected in general. But yes. like when it's your creative baby or something like that, it's really, really, really tough. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and one last question: I always ask all my uh, my guests. Um, okay. One of your favorite movies of all time. Oh, man. <laughs> of all time. Um, Back to the Future too. Back to the Future too. It's <laughs> we, up there. We, we could do a whole interview on the Back. It's to so the funny that she like, likes Back to the Future too because I'm I'm obviously Back to the Future one and then Back to the Future three and two is like <laughs> well uh, two in a lot of ways. All right, we'll, we'll geek out for a second. Uh, two in a lot of ways. A lot of people just call it the connective tissue between yeah three because so three it's is funny awesome that you like that one. and I actually really enjoy two. Looking back at it, when I first saw, it, I mean one is you know one yeah yeah. But two now go, now that we're past 2015, it's so awesome to watch what they thought and oh, so many wow. things they got right. Yeah, it yeah. was kind of like that's. I have to watch it again. Yeah, it's so crazy. Like you know, they had Google glasses like uh, back then. Oh, they did. They did. They yeah, had Google glasses. They had the the, the um, uh, FaceTime, you know, going yeah. on. They, had a, they got a lot of stuff. Are you know, incredibly right? And you know, there there is a hoverboard now. Yeah. Yeah, they do yeah, have the, 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 well, the Lex one. Yeah, not like, yeah, just not like the one he did, but yeah. it's pretty cool. All right, so your favorite Your favorite movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie, I, I don't know. I, I, if What's coming to mind is more like movies that I watch over and over again. Fun, yeah. um, I think for me, just off the top of my head, um, I would say Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Oh, um, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, right? That's, a, that's, yeah. A, that's, that's Adam Bowman. Yeah. That's one of his um, favorite movies. That's, De- my, that's Deacons who shot that, right? Roger Deacons. Shh, um, so beautiful, that movie. Who also did uh, Back to the Future. Deacons? De- really? Didn't, didn't Roger no, Deacons? No, Deacons didn't do Back to the Future. Dean. Oh, that's Dean. Oh, okay. Yeah, that okay. was Dean Cundy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in Deacons. I'm uh, sorry. We're so film geeking out right now. Sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, I'd say Shaun of the Dead is another one. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. I, Edgar, I'm a huge Edgar Wright fan. Oh, he's so amazing, um, isn't he? Yeah, I wish he'd hurry up and make another movie. I know. Like, um, his Ant Man would have been interesting. Yeah, <laughs> his Ant Man right? would have been so. I, I you could and see, you could, you could, you could see smell him in it. Yeah. the Edgar Wright stank. Yeah. on yeah. a lot of that <laughs> of that movie, you could like, oh, that, oh, that's what they got. They got that got in. Exactly, that got in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, like, what else? Like the, I don't know. For some reason, like the. These like when I was doing Drunk Town, right? Because Drunk Town like mm-hmm. seven years, and these are like the films I would watch over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like the David Fincher Zodiac film, mm-hmm. which is which is yeah. one of all right, cool. Which yeah, is, that's my guy. Yes, it's honestly I'm a huge Fincher fan. I've been right. studying him since the commercial days. Yeah, like I was, I had I had a connection to propaganda, and they would send me his commercials. Uh, and like wow. his his short films and stuff on VHS, so uh, wow. he like do these compilations of his demo reels, like stuff that no, no one I've ever seen. Yeah, and I just sit there and watch and study all that. And I'm a huge Fincher fan, so Zodiac's one of those underrated because it's now yeah. starting to come back up as a masterpiece. It's like one of those, wow. you know, like when Kubrick makes one of his movies and he's like, oh, like ten years yeah. later, like oh my god. Yeah, so yeah. Zodiac's one of those. Yeah. And I think I think the thing that I find interesting, like those are all like on paper, those are films that I don't think I would like. Mm-hmm. And yet like I'm like completely fascinated he's, by all of them. And he's in he's just, you know, Fincher's yeah. Fincher's our current day Kubrick, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So well thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank, thank you so thank you. Thank you for it was, having it was me. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for watching. I am guys. inspired. I think I think it's a really great story. Go make your movie. Yeah, Keep going. Yeah, thanks. There really is no reason why you don't go out and make your movie after hearing Sydney's uh, <laughs> her her journey as a filmmaker, uh, the struggles that she had to go through. It, it, it was remarkable that she's gotten to the heights that she's gotten to, and she's able to start building her career and working as a full time filmmaker. It's it's really remarkable and and an inspiration to uh, anyone listening that no matter where you come from, no matter what your beginnings. Uh, You can break free. You can do something. It's all about how much you are willing to do, how much work you're willing to put in, how many years you're willing to put in, and how resilient you're going to be moving forward in your career. 
it is possible. And Sydney Freeland is definitely an example of that. So Sydney, thank you so much for your inspiration. I cannot wait to see your movie. Uh, it will be on Netflix. If you want to see the trailer for Deidre and Laney Rob a Train, uh, just head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 133. I hope you guys have been enjoying this rapid fire podcast release <laughs> dates. Uh, next week will probably be very similar. We're going to try to knock out as many as we can during the week. Uh, and uh, and then probably a, a total will probably have around 10 episodes, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. I have to check. Uh, but after that, we'll go back to our normal routine of uh, two episodes, sometimes three with Throwback Fridays um, uh, every week. So uh, it's been kind of crazy for me, but I'm going to do my best to continue popping these out every day for the next week or so until we run out of Sundance interviews. But I hope you guys are getting a lot out of it. I've had a ball doing it. And we will be adding these to our YouTube channel at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. And that channel has all of our podcasts uh, in YouTube as well as all a bunch of video tutorials, the live versions of all the Sundance interviews. So you can see Elijah Wood and the, the Spectre Vision team have a interesting time uh, being interviewed by me and Sebastian. Uh, it, it, it's worth watching, guys. Those guys are amazing. It's so, so much fun. But uh, IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. And don't forget, if you guys want to jumpstart your filmmaking career, head over to IndieFilmSyndicate.com. We have over, gosh, now at least you know 400 video lessons uh, and just, I don't know, I think over a hundred hours of uh, of video lessons uh, from everything from filmmaking, directing, uh, distribution, cinematography, screenwriting, uh, and post production, all sorts of stuff. And we're adding new stuff every month. Um, so please head over to indiefilmsyndicate.com to check out the leading filmmaker uh, membership site. Have a great weekend, guys, and keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.